Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure and privilege to welcome you to the 20th annual Hampstead Synagogue Isaiah Berlin Lecture. Sir Isaiah Berlin was a member of our synagogue, the family's membership having begun when his parents joined in the 1920s. After Sir Isaiah's death in 1997, we wanted to mark his connection with our shul on an ongoing basis. And so we approached Lady Berlin and the members of Sir Isaiah's family to ask if they would agree to our synagogue holding an annual lecture in Sir Isaiah's memory. We were delighted and honoured when they consented, and we thank in particular Sir Isaiah's stepson our dear friend, Mr. Peter Halben, for his close cooperation in making the many arrangements for the lectures each year and for his constant encouragement and support. For two decades, Zaki Cooper has worked tirelessly and with immense skill and dedication in spearheading the organization of the lectures and in securing a quite extraordinary world-class roster of speakers. Friends, this year's lecture takes place, of course, in the shadow of the passing of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II and during the period of national mourning for our much loved and greatly respected monarch. We are continuing with tonight's event as scheduled, not only because it is a major event in intellectual and cultural terms and therefore entirely in keeping with the serious nature of these days, but also because the values championed by Sir Isaiah so closely converge with the ideals by which the Queen lived and led. It is a particular pleasure to warmly welcome this year's Isaiah Berlin lecturer, Professor Michael Sandel, who was already a renowned philosopher in my undergraduate days as a student of the subject several decades ago, and who has since become a celebrated thinker of global influence and impact. I now hand over to Zaki Cooper to introduce him. Thank you, Rabbi Harris. A good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and distinguished guests. It's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Michael Sandel, deliver tonight's 20th annual Isaiah Berlin Lecture. As Rabbi Harris mentioned, the lecture takes place at a sad and momentous time as we mark the passing of the Queen. But we hold this event well aware of the period of national mourning. So Isaiah and the Queen knew each other and we'll hear a bit more about that after the lecture. Professor Sandel teaches political philosophy at Harvard University and is one of the world's best known and widely followed public intellectuals. His books on justice, democracy, ethics, and markets have been translated into more than 30 languages. His free online course, Justice, has been viewed by tens of millions of people. And his BBC series, The Global Philosopher, was a major hit. Professor Sandel has strong ties to the UK. He received his doctorate from Balliol College, Oxford University in 1985, and also delivered the prestigious Wreath Lectures just over 10 years ago. His lectures have packed out venues such as St. Paul's Cathedral and the Sydney Opera House. All this has led to some describing him as the world's most influential living philosopher. The title of this evening's lecture is The Tyranny of Merit, What's Become of the Common Good. This title is also the subject of his latest book, which was named as the Book of the Year by many publications. As this lecture is fully online, we invite you to post questions during it. Please look at the screen for further instructions on how to do that. And at the end of the lecture, our synagogue co-chair, Madeleine Abrahamson, will be guiding us through the Q&A. Uh, Professor Sandel, we eagerly await to hear what you have to say, and over to you. Thank you, Zaki, Rabbi Harris, Peter Halban, and distinguished guests. What an honor it is for me to deliver the Isaiah Berlin Lecture of the Hempstead Synagogue. Isaiah Berlin was a, a hero of mine. By the time 
I was in Oxford doing my graduate work. Sir Isaiah had retired, but he never really retired. He was always a vital, energizing, inspiring presence. I remember that a group of us graduate students in political philosophy at Balliol College organized an evening discussion group that met once a month. We called it the T.H. Green Society, and we invited the most distinguished philosophers and thinkers of our day. And of course, we were, we were delighted when Isaiah Berlin agreed to accept our invitation to come one evening and give us a talk, which was, as always, a, a dazzling tour de force in the history of political thought and also on the relevance of political philosophy to contemporary questions, big questions such as liberty, democracy, and what it is to bring about a just society. So I'm deeply honored to give this lecture. I can't promise that Sir Isaiah would have agreed with every word and every argument I'm about to offer, um, but I relish uh, the thought that the lecture is at least in the spirit of uh, uh, political and philosophical inquiry that so many of us learned from Isaiah Berlin. My subject is the tyranny of merit. It's a paradoxical turn of phrase, I concede, because we normally think of merit as an ideal as something worth aiming at, as an aspiration. If I need surgery, I want a well-qualified surgeon to perform it. That's merit. If I'm flying in an airplane, I want a well-qualified pilot at the controls. So how can merit, which is an aspiration, an apparent ideal, how can merit become a kind of tyranny? That's the question I'd like to discuss tonight. To explain how, let's cast, our, let's cast our thoughts back over the past four decades. In recent decades, the divide between winners and losers has been deepening, poisoning our politics, setting us apart. Now, this has partly to do with widening inequalities of income and wealth that have unfolded as a result of the version of globalization we've seen over the past four decades. But it's not only that. The divide between winners and losers has also to do, I think, with the changing attitudes towards success that have accompanied the rising inequality. Those who've landed on top have come to believe that their success is their own doing the measure of their merit, and that they therefore deserve the full measure of the bounty that the market bestows upon them. And by implication, that those who struggle, those left behind, must deserve their fate as well. This rather harsh attitude towards success and failure reflects, and here's the beginning of our paradox, reflects the ideal that animates this way of thinking about success, the ideal of meritocracy, the principle that says, if chances are equal, the winners deserve their winnings. This is the heart of the meritocratic ideal. In practice, of course, we fall short. Not everyone has an equal chance to succeed. Children born to poor parents tend to stay poor as adults. Affluent parents have figured out how to pass their advantages onto their kids. At Ivy League universities, such as my own, there are more students, despite generous financial aid and scholarship schemes, there are more students from the top 1% than from the entire bottom half of the country combined. But the problem isn't only 
that we fail to live up to the meritocratic ideals we profess. The ideal is flawed. The ideal has a dark side and it's this. Meritocracy is corrosive of the common good. It leads to hubris among the winners and to humiliation for those who lose out. It encourages the successful to inhale too deeply of their own success, to forget the luck and good fortune that helped them on their way, to lose sight of their indebtedness to those who made their achievements possible. Family, neighborhood, teachers, community, country, the times in which they lived. Not only that, it leads the successful to look down on those less fortunate than themselves. Now, my argument against the tyranny of merit is partly philosophical and partly political. The philosophical argument is about merit as a principle of deservingness. The idea is that everyone, if everyone starts out with an equal chance, then those who succeed deserve the rewards they bring. But this principle is open to three objections. First, having the talents that enable one to get ahead, having these talents isn't my doing, one's own doing, it's my good fortune. If everyone begins the race at the same starting point, if everyone has equal access to good coaches and training facilities and nutrition and running shoes and so on, then it's predictable who will win, the gifted runners. But being gifted is a matter of luck. So it's hard to see how the winners can claim that they morally deserve the winnings of the race. Second objection, that I live in a society that happens to prize the talents I happen to have, that too is my good luck. Consider a great and highly paid athlete, Cristiano Ronaldo, for example. Ronaldo is a great football player. He reaps enormous rewards for deploying his talents. But these rewards reflect the fact that Ronaldo lives in a society and at a time when football is hugely popular. Had Ronaldo lived back in the days of the Renaissance, his earnings and his fame would probably have been less. People weren't that interested in basketball back then they cared more about fresco painters. So these two arguments about the contingencies of talent and about the moral arbitrariness of market demand for this or that talent, both call into question the idea that I deserve the benefits the market bestows on me in virtue of the talents I exercise. And there's a third objection. This has to do with the attitudes towards success that meritocratic societies promote. This has to do with the tendency to meritocratic hubris. Such hubris, the idea that I deserve my success, this hubris, hubris isn't only morally unattractive it also deepens the divide between winners and losers. And it's this attitude that is corrosive of the common good. Now, one way to address this divide is to try to double down on the meritocratic ideal, to try to level the playing field so that everyone has a truly equal chance to become a winner. 
but even this can't heal the inequalities of esteem that meritocracies produce. Inequalities of esteem, this is at the heart of the third objection. For every, even if we could somehow achieve a society where everyone had a genuinely equal chance to succeed, the divide between winners and losers would persist. The real problem lies in the image of social life as a competitive race, a race in which the successful believe and have some reason to believe that they have earned their success and the benefits that flow from it. In fact, paradoxically, the closer we come to achieving truly equal opportunity, the more plausible it seems to those who succeed and to those who struggle that the winners have earned their success and so deserve its rewards. Now, this third argument against meritocracy was the one raised by Michael Young, the British sociologist who coined the term meritocracy in a 1958 book called The Rise of the Meritocracy. Although we have come to regard meritocracy as an ideal, Young considered it a kind of dystopia. He warned of the hubris it would breed among the successful and of the demoralization it would inflict on those who didn't rise. Now, Young's case against meritocracy was about the moral psychology of earning and deserving. It was about the moral basis of social esteem. And, but if he's right, the attitudes towards success that meritocracies produce make it hard to redress inequalities of income and wealth through redistribution. Here's why. The more confident we are that market outcomes track moral desert, the more powerful the presumption that income and wealth should lie where they fall. Now, the idea that our fate reflects our merit, this idea goes back much further than Michael Young's 1958 dystopian account. In fact, this idea, this moral intuition runs deep in the, in, within Western culture itself. Biblical theology teaches that natural events happen for a reason. Favor, favorable weather and a bountiful harvest are divine rewards for good behavior. Drought and pestilence are punishments for sin. This is a, a familiar biblical moral picture. When a ship encounters stormy seas, people ask who on the crew has angered God. Now, from the distance of our scientific age, this way of thinking may seem innocent, even childlike, but it is not as distant as it first appears. In fact, this biblical outlook is the origin of meritocratic thinking. It reflects the belief that the moral universe is arranged in a way that aligns prosperity with merit and suffering with wrongdoing. This way of thinking is not so far from the familiar contemporary view that wealth signifies talent and hard work and that poverty signifies indolence. Two features of the biblical outlook offer an intimation of contemporary meritocracy. One is its emphasis on human agency, being responsible for my fate. The other is its harshness toward those who suffer misfortune. And we see this very clearly, if we recall the book of Job, you'll remember 
Job was a just and righteous man, and yet he was subject to unspeakable pain and suffering, including the death of his sons and daughters in a storm. Ever faithful to God, Job cannot fathom why such suffering has been visited upon him. He doesn't realize, you remember the story, that he's the victim of a cosmic wager in which God seeks to prove to Satan that Job's fate will not waver whatever hardship he encounters. As Job mourns the loss of his family, his friends who were gathered around him insist that he must have, he, Job, must have committed some egregious sin. And they press Job to imagine what that sin might be. This is an early example of the tyranny of merit. Armed with the assumption that suffering is signifies sin, Job's friends, if you can even call them friends, cruelly compound his pain by claiming that in virtue of some transgression or other, Job must be to blame for the death of his sons and daughters. And although he knows he is innocent, Job shares his companion's theology of merit. And so he, he cries out to God, asking why he, a righteous man, is being made to suffer. When God finally speaks to Job, he, God, rejects the cruel logic of blaming the victim, and he does so by renouncing the meritocratic assumption that Job and his companions share. Not everything that happens is a reward or a punishment for human behavior. That's what God proclaims from the whirlwind. All rain is not for the sake of watering the crops of the righteous, nor is every drought for the sake of punishing the wicked. It rains, after all, in places where no one lives, in the wilderness, which is empty of human life. Creation, God conveys to Job, creation is not only for the sake of human beings. The cosmos is bigger, and God's ways are more mysterious than the anthropomorphic picture suggests. God confirms Job's righteousness, but chastises him for presuming to grasp the moral logic of God's rule. This represents, this teaching uh, uh, to Job represents a kind of departure from the theology of merit that informs Genesis and Exodus. In renouncing the idea that he presides over a cosmic meritocracy, God asserts his, his unbounded power and teaches Job a lesson in humility. Faith in God means accepting the grandeur and the mystery of creation, not expecting God to dispense rewards and punishments based on what each person merits or deserves. Now this question of merit reappears in Christian debates about salvation, where the debate takes the following form. Do the faithful earn salvation through religious observance and good works? Or is God entirely free to decide whom to save, regardless of how people live their lives? This debate reverberates throughout centuries of Christian debate. And, and yet it echoes this debate about merit and grace, about hubris and humility. This debate, the tension between these two orientations 
to salvation, or for that matter, success, echo in our more secular age. For Luther and Calvin and the Puritans, debate about merit were about salvation. For us, debates about merit are about worldly success. Do the successful earn and therefore deserve their success? Or is prosperity due to factors beyond our control? You might think these two debates have little in common. One is religious, the other is secular. But on closer inspection, the meritocracy of our day bears the mark of the theological contest from which it emerged. Even today, our attitudes towards success are not as independent of providential faith as we sometimes think. The triumphalist aspect of meritocracy generates hubris among the winners and humiliation among the losers. It reflects a residual providential faith that persists in the moral vocabulary of otherwise secular societies. Max Weber was alive to this about a century ago. Weber wrote the following, the fortunate man is seldom satisfied with the fact of being fortunate. Beyond this, Weber wrote, he needs to know that he has a right to his good fortune. He wants to be convinced that he deserves it. And above all, that he deserves it in comparison with others. He wants to be allowed the belief that the less fortunate also merely experience their due. The tyranny of merit arises from this impulse. Today's secular meritocratic order moralizes success in ways that echo the earlier providential faith. Although the successful don't claim they owe their power and wealth to divine intervention, rather they see themselves as rising thanks to their own effort and hard work, they nonetheless are inclined to think, we nonetheless are inclined to think, that our success reflects our superior virtue. The rich are rich because they are more deserving than the poor. This triumphalist aspect of meritocracy is a kind of providentialism without God, at least without a God who intervenes in human affairs. The successful make it on their own, but their success attests to their virtue. This way of thinking highlights sorry, and heightens the moral stakes of economic competition. It sanctifies the winners and denigrates the losers. So this is the reason to worry about meritocracy and to look beyond its seemingly democratic egalitarian character, to notice the inequality of esteem that even a fully realized meritocracy makes possible. So how should we respond? What should we do? How, what kind of alternative to meritocratic, meritocratic hubris and humiliation should we seek out? This, these are questions that we need to reconsider today, especially given the deep polarization that afflicts our politics. I'd like to suggest that there is a connection between the meritocratic attitudes towards success that I described, and the way our politics has unfolded in recent years. One of the most potent sources of the populist backlash against elites is the sense among many working people that elites look down on them. And this grievance 
seems to me a legitimate complaint. Consider again the way the economy and our societies have unfolded over the past four decades. Even as globalization brought deepening inequality and stagnant wages, its proponents offered working people some bracing advice. If you want to compete and win in the global economy, go to college. What you earn will depend on what you learn. You can make it if you try. These elites fail to see the insult implicit in their advice. And the insult is this. If you didn't go to university, and if you're not flourishing in the new economy, your failure must be your fault. You fail to improve yourself, as we recommended, as we urged you to do. It's no wonder that many working people have turned against meritocratic elites. Those of us who spend our days in the company of the credentialed can easily forget a simple fact. Most of our fellow citizens don't have a university diploma. Nearly two thirds in the US and a similar proportion in Britain do not. So it's folly to create an economy that makes a university degree a necessary condition for dignified work and a decent life. Please don't misunderstand. I'm very much in favor of encouraging people to go to university, broadening access to university for those from, who can't afford it is enormously important. What I'm suggesting, however, is that simply encouraging more people to get a university degree is not an adequate solution to the inequality and to the wage stagnation of the past four decades. We should focus less on arming people for a meritocratic race and focus more on making life better for those who may lack a diploma, but who nonetheless make essential contributions to our society through the work they do, through the families they raise, and through the communities they serve. This is especially important when we consider the effect that the valorization of a university degree has had not only on our society, not only on attitudes towards success, but also on representative government itself. Those who are well-educated have long been disproportionately represented in Congress and in Parliament. And yet today, those without a university degree are virtually absent from the institutions of representative government. In as recently as the early 1960s, to give you an idea, in the United States, one fourth of the senators and members of the House of Representatives who were elected despite lacking a university degree. But today, uh, almost, almost no members of the Senate and the House of Representatives are members, uh, are, uh, do not have a university degree. One consequence of this diploma divide is that very few members of the working class today make it to elective office. In the US, about half of the labor force is employed in working class jobs defined as manual labor, the service industry and clerical jobs. What percent of members of Congress had such jobs before they were elected? 2%. This credentialist prejudice is also changing the face of representative government in Britain and in Europe. 
In Britain, as in the US, those without di with diplomas govern those without. In the UK, about 70% do not have a university degree. In Parliament, only 12% do not. Over the past four decades, Britain's Labour Party has undergone an especially striking shift in the educational and class background of its MPs. As recently as 1979, 41% of Labour MPs were elected to Parliament without having received a university degree. By 2017, only 16% managed to do so. Working class MPs now constitute only 4% of the House of Commons. And we, there's a similar trend that can be seen in the parliaments throughout Western Europe. The virtual absence from government of non-university graduates is a development of the meritocratic age but it's not unprecedented. It's more than a li little troubling to recall that there was a time when this was also true. The time before working people had the right to vote. The highly credentialed profile of today's European parliaments resembles the profile of European parliaments in the late 19th century when property qualifications were still in place. Then in Germany and France and the Netherlands and Belgium, most members this in the mid to late 19th century uh, had university degrees. This changed in the 20th century with the rise of socialist and social democratic parties. This democratized the, the composition of parliaments. From the 1920s to the 1950s, MPs without university degrees served in substantial numbers, accounting for a third to a half of members of parliament in Europe. But by the 2000s, by the age of meritocracy, non-university graduates were as rare in the national legislatures of Britain and Europe and the United States as they were in the days of aristocrats and the landed gentry. Now, some might argue that government by well-educated university graduates is something to welcome, not regret. Surely we want well-qualified engineers to build our bridges, well-qualified doctors to perform our appendectomies. So why not seek elected representatives who attended the best universities? Aren't highly educated leaders more likely than those with less distinguished credentials to give us sound public policies and reason public discourse, one might ask. Well, no, not necessarily. Even a cursory glance at the parlous state of public discourse in the US Congress or in parliament should give us pause. Governing well requires not just prestigious credentials or the ability to score high on tests, governing well requires practical wisdom and civic virtue. It requires an ability to deliberate about the common good and to pursue it effectively. But these qualities are not well developed in most universities today, even those universities with the highest reputations. Recent experience suggests little correlation between the capacity for political judgment, which involves character as well as knowledge and insight, and the ability to score well on standardized tests and to win admission to elite universities. The idea that the best and the brightest are better at governing than their less credentialed fellow citizens is yet another myth born of meritocratic hubris. So how can we change the terms of public discourse in the public culture and the way we value our fellow citizens to take account of this? We sh part, of, part of any response, it seems to me, is to renew the dignity of work and to put it at the center of our politics. 
we need to remember that work is not only about making a living. It's also about contributing to the common good and winning recognition, public recognition for doing so. One of my political heroes, Robert F. Kennedy, who was assassinated as he ran for president in 1968. Robert F. Kennedy put it well half a century ago. Fellowship, community, shared patriotism, he said, these essential values do not come from just buying and consuming goods together. They come instead from dignified employment at decent pay, the kind of employment that enables us to say, I helped to build this country. I am a participant in its great public ventures. This civic sentiment is largely absent from our public life today. It is tempting to assume that the money people make is the measure of their contribution to the common good. But this is a mistake. The Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. explained why. Shortly before he was assassinated, Martin Luther King went to speak to some striking sanitation workers, garbage collectors in Memphis, Tennessee. And this is what he told them. He said, the person who picks up our garbage is in the final analysis as significant as the physician, because if he doesn't do his job, diseases are rampant. And then he added, all labor has dignity. Today's pandemic, the experience we've just endured these recent years, made this clear. The pandemic revealed how deeply we rely on workers we often overlook. Delivery workers, maintenance workers, grocery store clerks, truckers, nurse assistants, childcare workers, home health care providers. These are not the best paid or most honored workers in our societies. But during the pandemic, we began referring to them as key workers, as essential workers. So this could be a moment, a prompt for a broader public debate about how to bring their pay and recognition into better alignment with the importance of their work. But beyond renewing the dignity of work in, a, in the way we shape our economy and in the terms of public discourse, we also need something else, a kind of moral, even spiritual turning. We need to reconsider the meaning of our success. We need to question our meritocratic hubris. We need to ask, for example, do I morally deserve the talents that enable me to flourish? Is it my doing that I live in a society that prizes the talents I have? Or is that my good luck? Insisting that my success is my due makes it hard to see myself in other people's shoes. By contrast, appreciating the role of luck in life can prompt a certain humility. There, but for the accident of birth, or the grace of God, or the mystery of fate, go I. That could be me. This sentiment, this spirit of humility, is the civic virtue we need now. It is the beginning of the way back from the harsh ethic of success that drives us apart. It points us beyond the tyranny of merit toward perhaps a less rancorous and more generous public life. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Sandel. Um, we haven't had many questions in. I'm going to go through what we have. But if you still have questions, please go to the Slido link that's showing at the moment. It's very easy to use it. Uh, you just text in your questions. Questions have to be brief. It doesn't allow more than 160 characters, which is at least more than a tweet. So 
um, let me look at the questions. Um, what about religious communities? This is a question from Zaki Cooper. You talked about the biblical implications earlier. Do religious communities help to mitigate some of the drawbacks of meritocracy? Where do they fit into this debate on meritocracy? As in so much else, religious communities and religious faith can be sources of strength and renewal or can be corrosive of the values that sustain a shared public life. I think that religious communities can and should make an important contribution to reconsidering the harsh ethic of success that expresses a meritocratic orientation to our lives and that deepens the divide between winners and losers. Because most religious traditions emphasize in one way or another that we as human beings are not self-made and self-sufficient, that we are indebted and that we are in some ways, whatever our resources, we are dependent creatures. And so in this way, I think that religious, uh, religious traditions and teachings can be a powerful uh, source of challenge to the idea that we are self-made and self-sufficient, which is after all the idea that gives rise to the meritoc meritocratic hubris, uh, Zaki, that I've criticized. Thank you. Right, next question is from Max Alter. Um, Max wrote long questions. I've tried, we have tried to edit this. Um, meritocratic hubris relies on market results. The market, though, seems here conceived as purely individualistic, as, for example, in Aristotle. Would it be possible to construct a pro-meritocratic argument based on a social rather than an individualistic argument? Well, thanks to Max for the question. Yes, in principle, it's possible, but it's important to notice how, um, how different that understanding of meritocracy would be from a conception in which market success is the measure of merit. If we uh, understood the value of people's contributions to be measured, not by the market's verdict, but instead, uh, if we deliberated together as democratic citizens about what truly counts as a valuable contribution to the common good, then it would be desirable and it would be appropriate to accord honor and recognition and esteem to those who contributed to genuine value, not value as measured uh, very often mistakenly by the market. It is tempting to assume that the money people make is the measure of their contribution to the common good. But by that assumption, we would have to say that the hedge fund manager contributes more than a thousand times the value, social value of a contribution uh, as a school teacher or as a nurse. But even the most ardent laissez-faire defenders of markets would be hard pressed to make out that moral claim. So if we were able to recast our understanding, here's another way of putting it, Max. In recent decades, we have outsourced our moral judgment about what counts as a valuable contribution to markets. 
And part of what I'm suggesting is that we need to reclaim that judgment, that moral judgment as democratic citizens from markets and instead reason together about what's truly valuable. If we were able to reclaim the moral judgment about contribution for democratic citizenship and moral argument and reflection, and if we were able to reconfigure the economy and the society to honor and reward um, the people based on their contributions of real value to this deliberated conception of, of what counts as a contribution, then you could call it, I'll concede, Max, then, then one could call it a kind of meritocracy, but it would be a meritocracy of virtue and the common good not a meritocracy where what counts as contributing is defined by the operation of the market. So how, how do we encourage this humility? Another question. In other words, how do we change um, this attitude towards mediocrity? Uh, I think we we challenge the hubris um, at, at different levels, beginning with parents and children. Part of what has made meritocracy oppressive, I've, I've emphasized here the unfairness to those who lose out, but let's also consider the consequences of meritocratic competition for admission to top universities, the consequences on young people who are often subjected to tremendous anxiety producing pressure and stress through their adolescent years and often before by well-intentioned but pressuring parents who are trying to ensure that they will uh, be equipped to compete effectively for uh, admission to elite universities. This takes a toll on the, win uh, on the winners, as well as inflicting a harm on, on those who struggle, those who are left out. So the first thing we need to do as parents is to revise the moral education we give our children by example and explicitly. It's tempting as a parent to say, you must work hard and how you do on A-levels and where you get admitted will be the result of your own doing, of your effort, of your hard work. It's up to you. And then to lavish them with praise if they succeed. But that can go much too far. That moral teaching, that mode of parenting almost reinforces, almost requires that students think of their young people, think of their success as their own doing. And this generates the hubris among those who succeed. And it also generates deep demoralization among those who don't make the mark, make the grade. So we need to begin at the lessons we teach our young people. Then writ large, I think we need to have a much broader debate about the economy, uh, including the system of tax and the notion of social contribution that underlies it. We could begin by asking, for example, why do we tax, should we tax, earnings from labor, earnings from work at a higher rate than we tax uh, the money people make from interest and dividends and capital gains? Why do we do that? What does that tell us about the way we value uh, work, work in the ordinary sense? Um, and to, to, use, to, to use this question and other questions like it to prompt a public debate that can begin to reclaim this question of social value and contribution and what's worthy of honor and recognition from seemingly neutral abstract market forces to us as democratic citizens. So these are two ways I would try to, um, uh, to change, the, change the public culture 
that gives rise to the hubris and the humiliation. Lots of questions coming in now as you're speaking. Um, surely rewards for work are always going to reflect the arithmetic that if a thousand people can do some task, it will pay much less than a task which only two can do. That's true. But what that suggests is asking ourselves the question, suppose I'm one of the two people, the only two people in the world who can perform a certain task or to be as great a footballer as Ronaldo or Messi or Wayne Rooney. If that's true, if I reap enormous rewards because I'm one of only two people who can do something, whereas there are a thousand people who can do other, other things, that prompts the question, is it my doing? Is it to my credit that the skills I have happen to be scarce relative to the skills other people have? Or is that a purely contingent fact about the way my skills happen to fit with what's in demand and with the, the talents that other people have? Once we recognize that my being among the two, Richard, is just happenstance, circumstance, my good luck, then I'm not likely to insist that the premium that the market bestows on me, being among the two, having rare talents, is down to me and therefore my due. Thank you. You seem to suggest that some believe our societies have already achieved meritocracy. Surely it is an admirable ideal which we will never reach. Well, thank you for that, Tim. I agree with the second part. It's an ideal which we will never fully realize. And the reason it's worth noticing why not, and this goes back to Plato. You remember Plato's idea was, uh, he, he saw what we all recognize, that however much we try to achieve truly equal opportunity, the institution of the family means that some parents will be able to afford their children with greater advantages, cultural advantages, educational advantages, financial advantages. And however much we might try to level the playing field through scholarship schemes and the like, the institution of the family, if we, if we take it seriously, will always be a kind of obstacle to the realization of perfect equality of opportunity. Now, there are two ways of responding to this. One would be to say, if meritocracy is the ideal, then abolish the family to provide truly equal upbringing and opportunity. That was Plato's solution. Plato wanted children to be raised collectively. And, but that's quite a price to pay. And if that would violate important values that we rightly cherish, as I think it would, then the other response is to say, we're never going to have perfectly equal opportunity, though we should continue to strive for it to the extent we reasonably can. But that really undercuts the presumption that market rewards should lie where they fall. That uh, strengthens the idea that we should, when it comes to the distribution of resources, agree to share one another's fate. And so of the two ways, uh, and, and not to attribute to the winners deservingness. And that's of the two solutions, that's the one that I've, uh, I've defended and tried to propose tonight, Tim. Thank you. 
When a state and its organisations depend on philanthropy from the rich, as it does in the US and UK, isn't this a problem for the rebalance you wish for? Yes. Yes. And philanthropy is a good thing and it's a worthy thing for the most part. But if it comes... If the state, Kate, as you suggest, if the state and state organizations, uh, especially in a democracy, cannot raise the resources on their own democratically to provide for the essential needs of the public good, um, but instead has to rely in large measure on private philanthropy, that does compromise the public good because philanthropists, however well-intentioned, will have their own priorities, which may or may not correspond to what's needed uh, for the public good. I'll give you one small example drawn from the United States. You know, the Washington Monument in Washington, DC, this vast obelisk, it was damaged during, a, I think it was hit by lightning and it was fractured and it stood in need of repair. It was an expensive repair. Congress appropriated some $15 million to repair the Washington Monument, but this was not enough to finish the job. And so a philanthropist from private equity, a vastly wealthy philanthropist stepped forward to say, I will pay it for the rest of the refurbishment of the Washington Monument. In one way, it was a patriotic, uh, generous act. But it's also true that the private equity industry lobbies relentlessly for a tax loophole that exempts from a normal income tax of billions of dollars a year. So the amount that was grandly uh, donated by the philanthropist to repair the Washington Monument, which represents really the, the U.S. Capitol in its history, was a uh, was small change in comparison to the unjustified tax break that enabled him to exercise this philanthropic largesse. So we should welcome and encourage philanthropy and generosity but we should not uh, allow the state, uh, Kate, and its organizations to be drained of the financial resources it requires in a way that makes all of us dependent on the good favor and the uncertain judgment of, of philanthrop philanthropists. That's, that's, it seems to me, at odds with the spirit of democracy. Thank you. What evidence do you have that a sense of humiliation lies behind populism rather than other positive causes? I think there are uh, a range of causes of populism. And to some extent, the evidence depends on uh, observing the political rhetoric, the political arguments, and the political followings that populist candidates uh, attract to take the uh, to go back to 2016. The educational divide, the diploma divide, loomed very large in explaining uh, the Brexit vote. Those with advanced degrees voted overwhelmingly to remain. Those without degrees voted to leave. In the election of Trump. The, uh, those without a university degree uh, voted for Trump in 2016 and in 2020. And those with university degrees, and especially those with advanced degrees, voted for his Democratic opponents, for Hillary Clinton and then Joe Biden. In, in fact, the educational divide and the diploma divide has come to loom very large in explaining voting behavior. 
and it's a striking feature. This, this has been true in Britain, in the United States, in France, and other democracies. It used to be that those with, um, that well-educated voters tended to vote for center-right parties. For roughly speaking, class, class reasons, they tended to be the most affluent. Whereas working people, and those without degrees tended to vote for, for center left parties or socialist parties or social democratic parties. But as the age of meritocracy advanced, uh, the edge, this was reversed. And today, Thomas Piketty has done some very interesting empirical research showing that in France and in Britain and in the United States, the educational, uh, base of, of support for center left and center right parties flipped, became reversed um, most visibly in the 2000s and continued to, uh, uh, that continued to be the case today. So this is at least one among the reasons for the uh, politics of grievance that the, um, that uh, Trump was able to appeal to, uh, that Marine Le Pen in France is able to appeal to, uh, and that uh, animated much of the sense of grievance that we saw in play during the Brexit vote. Thank you. Um, one comment and question. Education takes too long. There is a call to organize real citizen resistance. Sometimes talking doesn't help. Is resistance the natural solution? Resistance by, I, I take Clifford is referring to when he speaks of citizen resistance. I'm guessing, I'm not sure, Clifford, I'm guessing you're referring to social movements that um, would seek to address the uh, the inequalities of income and wealth that we've been discussing. Um, if that's if that's what uh, Clifford is suggesting, I would say that social movements are necessary and important as a way of pushing the politicians, especially the mainstream political parties, um, into um, to addressing inequality more seriously, taking it more seriously. Um, not only in terms of the distribution of income and wealth, but also in terms of creating and rebuilding uh, uh, public places and common spaces that bring people together across class differences and across ethnic differences and across differences of life experience. One of the most corrosive features of the inequality we see today is that those who are affluent and those of modest means increasingly live separate lives. We send our children to different schools. We live and work and shop and play in different places. There are fewer and fewer genuinely class mixing public institutions. So uh, uh, social movements can be uh, important ways of trying to rebuild the civic infrastructure of a shared democratic life, as well as ways to press political parties to address the questions that really matter most, including uh, questions about how to address the widening inequalities that we face today. Clifford. I'm not sure if the question would have included um, sort of extreme movements um, not relevant to your talk, but things like the climate change movements that use physical activity to um, make their points. Well, the um, of course, there are the, the one extreme movement that comes immediately to mind on this side of the Atlantic were those who uh, who attacked the U.S. Capitol on January 6th, trying to prevent the certification of the election. So that too is a protest movement, a movement born of grievance. And uh, so in 
in deciding whether social movements are the problem or the solution, one has to look very closely about what the, the purpose, the mission of those movements uh, uh, may be. But I don't think, and this is a broader point, Madeline, about populism. In many ways, uh, populism has, has gotten a bad name in recent years uh, for its association with figures like uh, Trump and Marine Le Pen and Orban in Hungary and Bolsonaro in Brazil. And uh, I think it's important to, to call out uh, autocrats and autocracy directly and not to discredit populism by assuming that all populist movements are in support of autocrats such as these. Populism has a longer uh, democratic tradition that seeks to rally the people against the powerful and to hold um, corporations, companies, elites, and the wealthy to democratic account. That strand of the populist tradition and the social movements to which it gives rise are, I think, uh, resources uh, and sources of hope, of civic hope. Uh, so I, I hope we, we don't fall into the a tendency to assimilate populism too quickly and too completely with the autocratic figures who have governed in its name. Thank you. Um, a philosophical question. You've shown how the role of many types of luck undermine meritocratic, meritocratic assumptions. But if you take all the luck out of the picture, many more areas are affected. For instance, criminal justice. Is there a legitimate role for luck somewhere in the way we assess or judge people? Can we judge uh, or hold re people responsible for being lucky or unlucky? It is, that's a hard philosophical question. Um, generally speaking, we don't insofar as um, as success or failure, or for that matter, criminal activity is thought to reflect um, morally arbitrary factors beyond our control, we tend not to attribute uh, moral responsibility or at least moral deservingness in those cases, which is why to take the criminal justice example, when when someone is brought to trial in a criminal case, if they can show that they did not commit the crime willingly or deliberately, that is mitigating or exonerating. Now, there is the broader question about whether those who actually did knowingly commit crimes, whether they grew up under circumstances of limited opportunities, were unlucky to be born into hard circumstances. That raises some of the hardest questions of criminal justice. Um, but insofar as we appreciate the role of luck or circumstance in giving rise to the, uh, the behavior that finds its way into the criminal justice system, to that extent, we might be more inclined to seek uh, alternatives other than harshly retributive ones. So the relation between luck and, and personal responsibility is a fraught philosophical question. But the questioner, or perhaps it was you yourself, Madeline, um, have, have raised, has, uh, has raised a very important philosophical question about the relation between luck, deservingness, and justice. Thank you. Not my question. Um, the joy of rereading Isaiah Berlin's two concepts of liberty last week was free. Many successful recognize good fortune and give anonymous charity. Professor Sandel does not mention the UK's work opportunities, free libraries, museums, religious joy. 
Community interaction is free and often covers social differences. Well, I very much uh, I agree with that sentiment. Uh, and it connects the, the mention of free libraries and, and museums and religious communities and cultural institutions is it gestures toward what I was trying to describe before when I was speaking of public places and common spaces of shared uh, democratic citizenship. Uh, one of, uh, part of what I'm arguing about Jonathan, who, is the, who raised this question. In the book, The Tyranny of Merit, I'm trying to suggest that we have narrowed, um, narrowed our aspiration for what it means to live in a, to, to, to seek a broad democratic equality of condition. We've narrowed our vision insofar as we focus solely or mainly on addressing inequality by offering people individual upward mobility through higher education. I'm trying to suggest that that's too narrow. And I look back, uh, many people associate the American dream with individual upward mobility. And I, I do want to resist that, Jonathan, and perhaps this is in the spirit of your suggestion. I look back at the, at the writing of the person who coined the term the American dream. And what struck me is that he uh, is a man called James Truslow Adams. He did speak about the ability to rise not to be consigned to the circumstances uh, into which one was born. That's part of what he meant by the American dream, but only a part of it. He also said the American dream was about a broad democratic equality of condition. And the example he gave, this is why Jonathan's question puts it in mind, was the US Library of Congress. And what he wrote about it, I, I find inspiring. And I think it's in line, Jonathan, with your suggestion. He says, here's a symbol of what democracy can accomplish, a place of public learning that draws people from all walks of life. And if I could just, Madeline, read a couple of sentences of how he described this. As one looks down on the general reading room, which alone contains 10,000 volumes which may be read without even the asking. One sees the seats filled with silent readers, old and young, rich and poor, black and white, the executive and the laborer, the general and the private, the noted scholar and the schoolboy, all reading at their own library provided by their own democracy. Now, the author at this Adams considered this scene to be what he called the perfect working out in a concrete example of the American dream, the means provided by the resources of the people themselves and a public intelligent enough to use them. And he concluded, if this example could be carried out in all departments of our nat national life, the American dream would become an abiding reality. This seems to me an apt alternative of a common life, of a broad democratic equality of condition uh, that is, to my way of thinking at least, Madeline, an alternative aspiration to the notion that the successful uh, deserve their winnings and, uh, and the harsh divide between winners and losers that goes with it. It seems to me a healing vision but it's an ambitious one, and I don't un underestimate the difficulty of achieving it. That is a fantastic way of ending the Q&A. Although I have one tongue-in-cheek question. Mm. Of what you've said, what do you think Sir Isaiah Berlin would not have agreed with? Oh, that's a good question. And that occurred to me as I was contemplating this lecture. I think he would agree with the most part, for the most part. But here's the bit 
where he might have at least a small hesitation or question or challenge, perhaps I should put it. What I'm suggesting is that we need as democratic citizens to reason together about how to value goods and how to value the various social contributions that for the most part, the market decides for us. Part of the appeal of relegating these questions to markets is that the market seems to be a value neutral instrument for deciding questions of the common good. It seems to spare us the need to engage in messy, contentious public debates about how to value goods and contributions. Now, I have long been a critic of a version of liberalism, of liberal political philosophy that says government should be neutral on questions of the good life for fear that engaging in those debates will lead some to impose on others values they don't share. Now, Isaiah Berlin was not a defender of liberalism as neutrality. He wasn't. But I think he would be a bit uneasy at my suggestion that we should bring substantive debates about how to value goods directly into the public square. Perhaps he would think that's at odds with the spirit of liberalism. And here's why I think that, Madeline. Toward the end of one of his great essays, he said this, and this, this is one of the only, one of the few passages um, that he wrote um, that I, I would question. He said, a wise man once said, he quoted uh, actually, it was Joseph Schumpeter. A wise man once said that to realize the relative validity of one's convictions and yet to stand for them unflinchingly is what distinguishes a civilized man from a barbarian. So for Isaiah Berlin, the spirit of liberalism did depend, or so it seemed, on a certain kind of moral relativism as a way to a tolerant society. It's understandable. It's a powerful, compelling suggestion. But what, it, what I've called for a more strenuous, morally more engaged kind of public discourse that addresses contested questions about the good life, I, I fear that Sir Isaiah would have said, aren't you hearkening back to Aristotle and pre-liberal thinkers who wanted to bring questions of the good life and their virtue into politics. And isn't that, doesn't that pose a danger to liberty understood as stepping back from those disagreements? So uh, putting it, I've given you a longer answer, Madeline, uh, than you may have um, had bargained for. But if, if I have, it's only because the, the richness and the inspiring character of Sir Isaiah's political theory is for me a continuing invitation and temptation to imagine what he would have said and how the argument would have continued. Thank you so much. We have to stop continuing the argument at this point. I'm going to <laughs> hand over to those who are going to thank you. Professor Sandel, it, it falls to me to give a general vote of thanks, and you'll forgive me if I deal with others first and then come and concentrate on you for your remarkable lecture this evening. So I, I want to thank, of course, first of all, Peter and Martin Halbin and the family for their continued support of this lecture series, without which it could not have lasted for the 20 years so far that it has. So Peter, thank you all so much for that. I want to thank our technical team for having made tonight possible. And I hope that it's gone as smoothly for others as it seems to have gone for me. That doesn't always happen 
as I'm sure you know with online events, but tonight seems to have gone extremely smoothly. I want to thank everyone at, at, at Hampstead Synagogue, my synagogue, for having made tonight work in the way that it has all the preparation that went into it. And as one of those who worked with Rabbi Harris, with Madeline, with Zaki Cooper, to make these lectures happen over the years, I, I know that it's not always easy to find someone as astonishingly good as you, if I may say so. So Rabbi Michael, Madeline, Zaki, and everyone in the office at Hampstead and all who felt, thank you as well for making tonight happen. So the main event, um, it, it really has been a very powerful and thought provoking evening, I think for us all. People may not know that your course at Harvard in the noughties, Justice was the university's first to be freely available online and on television. And it's been seen by tens of millions of people since. And that's why when you were introduced earlier as the celebrated thinker of global influence and impact, that was an entirely justified description because you really are. And it is fitting that for the 20th Isaiah Berlin lecture, we look back at those who've gone before, that fantastic list of lecturers whose names were on the screen at the beginning. And I go back to the very first lecturer who was Rabbi Lord Sachs of blessed memory, because I know just how much he valued his conversations with you, his interactions with you over so many years. And for those who've enjoyed this evening, may I recommend that you go to BBC Sounds and look for the series that Rabbi Sachs did on the radio in 2018, Morality in the 21st Century. And in particular to go, I think it's episode 15, which was the remarkable conversation between you and him on the topic of how can we return to the politics of the common good. If people haven't listened to it, it really bears listening to, if you have it bears listening to again, particularly in the light of what you have treated us to this evening. This amazingly broad presentation of the topics that you've chose to give us. The tongue in cheek question at the end, I'm afraid came from me because I was intrigued to know what you think that the late Sir Isaiah would not have approved of. And, and, and you've answered that question. But I think that we could all say with certainty that he would undoubtedly have approved of the astonishing clarity of thought and of presentation that you've brought to the lecture this evening, together with the distinct lack of hubris that, that you show. And for someone who's occupied the place that you have on the global stage for so long, for you to have given us the time this evening to share with us these deep thoughts. As soon as we finish, I'm going online to order my own copy of The Tyranny of Mary. Um, and I'm sure others will feel inclined to do the same. So on behalf of everyone here, that the last thought that I would say, my thanks to you when you told us about the refurbishment of the Washington Monument, is that we must all be grateful that whoever the philanthropist was, he didn't insist on his name being added to it. It would have shown an amazing element of hubris that is probably found in philanthropists on, in the States and over here. But Professor Sandel, thank you so much for having shared your thoughts with us this evening. And for the final word, I'm going to ask Peter Halben to end the evening. Thank you. On this very sad weekend, in which we mourn the late majesty of the Queen, on behalf of us, our family, I would just like to add our own words of sincere thanks for our most incredible lecture, in which you uh, dig into some aspects of the life in which we lead. Uh, you answer the question where you and Isaiah might defer, but I would like to emphasize that you and Isaiah certainly share the deep fears of the society in which we lead. Thank you so much. I would also like to thank Rabbi Harris, Madeline Abraham and her colleagues, Henry Grunewald and Zahi Cooper for yet again 
arranging a most incredible lecture. This is the 20th, there'll be a hundred more lectures. Thank you so much.